Hello, my name's Jack Howard, and before we get started with my conversation with Kate Heron, I just want to thank our sponsor for this video, Surfshark VPN. They're offering you 83% off with three extra months for free when you use the promo code Jack Howard. And now please enjoy my conversation with Kate Heron where we get really into the, the nitty gritty of filmmaking to do with Marvel at this sort of level, which I was really excited to hear about. We get into absolutely everything, and still there was more I wanted to cover, but it really is worth your time so put it on in the background enjoy it like a podcast however you want um but yeah without further ado please enjoy oh you've got a reflector well i li- this is the most makeshift thing i've ever done <laughs> don't worry the press i was doing was in my childhood bedroom and i had literally <laughs> like that's when i called you and was like please help me with the screen <laughs> I don't uh, know you just I'm generalized doing. though you were just like you you've done youtube stuff surely you know how to set up a green yeah. screen which i've never done oh really by the way i just sort of <laughs> knew that you needed to clip it <laughs> you just sent me a photo yeah. and clips me like i've got i've got these i was like yeah like, use them did I, it end up working it did work yeah Good. it's like because you said to get the crocodile clip have you started by the way have we started yeah we have yeah oh Apparently. cool this will all be at the beginning gold <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i didn't know how to do it and i was just freaking out because i had to set up the screen and yeah it was a mess but yeah thank you for helping me because you're very welcome I just was like, who knows? Who would know? And I was like, Jack knows. Jack <laughs> lives on YouTube. He, under, he wouldn't know how to do this. Was that just for Zoom interviews? For press junket. Like, I was doing some of it from home because I have right. my dog and it's a bit fiddly like getting around. So like, yeah, so I basically was like, I'll do this one. I, I foolishly was like, oh, it'd be easy. I'll do it from home. <laughs> and then I was like, oh man, I don't have to do any of this because I'm not like, as a director, I'm more, I'm very good with actors. I'm very good with story because mm-hmm. I'm also a writer. But technical stuff like I so rely on my very smart crew yeah and like, I want even, this make yeah, that happen <laughs> yeah even like setting up the ring light I kept moving it and I was like I don't know how to light myself yeah yeah <laughs> like, it is a weird thing like yeah. I mean you've obviously just pointed out that in the room that we're in right now I've like got to make sure you can't mm-hmm. see it because there's a reflector on the, my face there's a reflector for Kate but yeah there's it's like I've got like just some <laughs> desk lamp um and it's propped up by a stool it's it's not professional at all um but thank you Kate for coming to do this <laughs> no thank you for chatting with me and getting nice. you out of your parents house yeah <laughs> do you know how a dream. funny I find it that a person who directs a Marvel television show lives with her parents that's so funny <laughs> I'm very cool <laughs> like, clearly yeah no it's just because I was away for so long and like I'm moving into my own place in September mm-hmm. and I haven't seen my family for like two years yeah. now and I my parents are like why don't you come live with us for the summer and I was like okay yeah That's a okay good let's, let's just go for it let's just <laughs> let's see what happens but yeah I mean it is weird it's almost like reverting to being like a teenager again yes. and like but it's probably good I think because like the show's been so well received and Having my like mum give me shit about taking the bin out, I Great. think it's probably it sort good of humbles my... you a little bit. Yeah, you just think... come off set working with Owen Wilson. <laughs> yeah, now you're taking out the bins for your mum. I, you know, yeah, I think it's good. <laughs> it's I think it's good. And my dad giving me instructions how to not kill his garden and like, yeah, I think it's probably good. It kind of grounds me in the real world a bit <laughs> from this weird, I don't know, just very weird dream. I've what been a to weird, use. what a weird thing it's been. I actually want to start with mm-hmm. how you and I met because uh-huh. I don't know if you remember, but. Because you'd just done Sex Education. Yeah. I, because I'm a big fan of Ben Taylor, who directed the first half of that, Mm -hmm. um, because he did Catastrophe and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And I remember the um, That's My Vagina (laughs) ending scene. That was the first one you did, right? Yeah. And then it cut to the directed by Kate Heron. And I remember being like, who the fuck are you? (laughs) Like, I just remember being like... Because I loved Ben Taylor so much and I was loving the show. And I was like, this is such a great episode. And then it was like, not Ben Taylor. And I was like... I need to find out who you are and found yeah. you on Twitter, yep. messaged you and was like, <laughs> any tips? And you were like, do you want to meet up for coffee? Which was just so lovely. And then we did and you told me that, and I don't want to tell your story for you, mm. so just let I'm me know. I'm intrigued to see how much you've, yeah. I've retained this quite well because I find it very inspiring. And oh. I think a lot of other people <laughs> will as well. That you told me that you were temping in an mm. office and the DP who was doing sex, edu- sex education Yeah you'd work with on something else. Yeah, Jamie. And Ben yeah. apparently took a meeting with you like as a favour or something and then mm-hmm. you got the job and then you got to go and do Loki. Yeah. What a... what a, You were <laughs> temping and then you got a Netflix show and then you got a Disney Plus show. What an amazing progression what an amazing journey that is congratulations that's incredible <laughs> is that accurate i know yeah, that's no, succinct you remembered it really well mm-hmm. yeah because i was working i'm trying to remember now because i've worked i was on like five temp agencies books 
um, because I just needed money and, you know, they call you last minute. And yeah, so when I got sex education, I was working at a fire extinguisher company and it was so boring, but obviously paid me. But I remember having, I had these spreadsheets and I remember, I think I having to mark where extinguishers were going out of like, expiry date. Mm-hmm. But anyway, but I remember getting the call that I got sex ed and I had to like, they must have, I remember keep, I kept going to the bathroom because I remember I was just so excited and I had to make all these weird phone calls in the bathroom and my boss was like, why do you keep going to the bathroom? And I was like, I just, you know, just, just one of those days, like, but I, but I was in the, Netflix. yeah, I was like in the loo, basically on the phone to my agent. And he was like, they want you to direct sex education. Like, wow. I couldn't believe it. Like, I, I think that, I mean, I really went for it with the pitch and Jamie. So basically he was the DP on a short I did for Sky Comedy mm-hmm. and we just got on really well. And I really loved working with him. Um, yeah, and um, we just, I think he had a similar, like, you know, he, I don't think he had like new one in the industry when he started. So, and sort of similar to me. And I think, I remember, I think I just, everyone I met in the industry, I'd be like, how did you do it? How did you get your job? How did yeah, you get in? How yeah. did you do this? That was, and, that was like my exact yeah. thing with you. I was just like, how the fuck did you do that? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why, because when people, you know, people ask, I'm always happy to talk about it because mm-hmm. I think it's so important to like demystify the situation because... It is a very weird one, isn't yeah. it? Where you just think like, <laughs> like I mean, even when I was a kid, my my mom used to tell people, oh, Jack wants to be a director. And they'd be like, yeah, but what does he really want to do? And it's like, yeah. it's this weird, like, <laughs> you can't get that. That's That's impossible. But you are evidence that it isn't. Yeah, I think that because like my mum was a midwife and my dad worked for various offices, basically, and like neither of them knew how to get into the industry. And like, basically, I think all my friends growing up, we've all gone down different paths. But it's like I remember that basically I used to be one of those annoying kids that like put on plays with their friends. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I'd be like, let's put on a play and you'll be this person and this person. And I suppose in a weird way, I was basically directing before I knew what directing was. Absolutely. I think I initially wanted to be an actor, which is like a horrible idea. I think I'm, everybody goes yeah. through a bit of a phase of just like wanting to do, <laughs> didn't know which part of it was. And then you realise, oh, I'm a control freak. I want to do yes. all of it. <laughs> yeah, because I used to write like fan fiction and stories, like Lord of the Rings fan fiction, by the way. Wonderful. Um, and I remember that kind of taught me how to write. <laughs> Who did write. you put together? <laughs> oh, Frodo and Sam, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> obviously. But sure. yeah, but I remember it was so funny writing those stories because like, yeah, you'd have like romantic storylines, obviously, because to be honest that's how you drew the people in to read it Mm -hmm. but beyond that I was just really excited writing about the characters I loved and taking them on new adventures and like I remember I had one story actually that was really similar to the movie Enchanted Okay. Um, not in the sense it was a romance but more just like I had all of the fellowship go to New York through a magical fountain Mm -hmm. and I remember Aragorn stabbed a bus in it and the same joke as in Enchanted and I was like well there's no way they would have found my fanfic but like multiverse yeah maybe (laughs) (laughs) but it it gave me confidence right seeing that because I I love I love that movie mm-hmm. and I remember being like oh I was like this is obviously like more professional than you know better writing than what I was doing but it showed my ideas weren't you know terrible because they were quite similar so I was like okay maybe there's something in my brain that people want to see so yeah and I think for me it was always you got immediate feedback from people and stuff they found because I like comedy right so yeah. it was always like funny kind of stuff so I think that's also something I realised was like oh people think I'm funny and they like the jokes in my stories you're basically yeah. just saying the story of my life like yeah. that is literally the same thing <laughs> I remember once when I was a kid I got told I wasn't funny and I was like oh, oh. I want to show you and yeah. then became quite a successful <laughs> comedy YouTuber <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think that's the thing though right it's like I think it's like a coping thing because in school, like, it was really weird, though. I wasn't picked on in, like, main school. It's just, this is really embarrassing. But it's just, like, so basically at drama club, I got bullied. <laughs> and, like, But you wouldn't think drama kids would, no. like, bully someone. But, like, There's I, a pecking order in drama club. <laughs> it's like West Side Story. Yeah. <laughs> it was all ganging up on me. But, just clicking at you. Yeah. Stop it, please. <laughs> I think it's because I was so introverted. And I'm quite, like, I've definitely got better at it. I mean, I'm, like, I'm sitting here talking with you. And I've mm. probably seemed, like, reasonably well-adjusted. But, like. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're doing all right. <laughs> But I was just so quiet. And I remember like sometimes when people first, even friends of mine actually that have met me have been like, oh, I just got this kind of vibe from you when I first met you because you were like really quiet. And I was like, no, I'm just really shy. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm just really shy. If you come up to me, I'll be like, Bleh, and I'll start talking at you. But <laughs> I just, won't stop and I won't know where we started. Yeah, yeah. 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 But I just, I think that was maybe part of it. But yeah, but I remember they like mercilessly like bullied me. Mm. It was awful. But yeah, but I, I kept with the drama club though. And I did, I did, I, oh, should we know? Tell a lie. I left that drama club because of the bullying. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went to Makes a new, sense. and I went to a new one on Saturdays, which I did for like ten years, I think. And I think there, it was sort of like 
crossing over with all these things I was doing. But basically my teacher there was like, oh, do you want to direct the play? And I was like, oh, directing. Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to give that a try. So that was kind of my first foray, I guess, into kind of directing actors. And it was it was a very, I, I apologise to Shakespeare. We did Julius Caesar, but like we all wrote like scenes. And you tried like, to improve on yeah. Shakespeare. <laughs> and it was hilarious because we're all like from London, right? Uh-huh. So, and I remember we had a scene where like Julius goes to heaven and it's like kind of like Cockney kind of heaven. It's like, welcome to heaven, Julius. And like, <laughs> yeah, it's like so loud. Like, I was like, man, I don't know what Shakespeare would think of this play. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he was like, yeah, good try. <laughs> I had to start somewhere as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but so I did that, and then um, I just had really amazing film studies teachers as well because I, I took film studies in sixth form mm-hmm. um, because I think I just didn't know a lot about film. I'd seen like I don't know like Lord of the Rings a million times, and there were loads of I guess films through actors that I'd seen a lot, but I didn't really understand what a director did or how a film. Set I still worked. don't think people really know what directing means, and I think mm-hmm. every every director defines it differently. But like, yeah. what did you discover when you were figuring that out? I think for me, it's almost like, I don't want to say like ringleader, but it kind of is like you're at the center of that like production, right? And you're the person they come to with decisions. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's like you need to come in with a clear vision and a clear tone. I'd say as a director, something really big you get hired on is your taste Mm -hmm. because your taste will echo out across the whole production, right? Because you hire all your heads of department. And when I say that, I mean like, you know, like uh, your director of photography who's in charge of camera or your production designer who's in charge of sets. And those people will have huge teams under them. But I think that it's like your taste will draw in like-minded collaborators Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's a massive part of it because then you can create something that I don't know like with Loki for example like I really I'd never got to hire like the heads of department before because this is the first thing I led as a director so for me it was really about finding uh, collaborators that had similar taste to me but then also beyond that obviously like bringing all these amazing ideas of their own and I think that's the thing for me as a director is I always feel My approach is I feel like a good idea can come from anywhere. And I think it's knowing when to encourage the idea or take the idea and be egoless about it in that sense, I guess. But also knowing when, I guess, like, oh, actually, that's really cool, but it's just not the story we're telling. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to go down that road. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the main thing. You're always shaping it and trying to kind of keep the train on tracks. And beyond that, I guess a big part people always talk about is working with the actors, but it's so much more than that. It's like um, how you shoot the scene, like when you're in a two shot, when you're in a close up, um, do you want it to be like, uh, okay, for example, in Loki with Owen and Tom in the elevator in episode one, like, so Autumn, uh, Kazra and I, we really wanted the TVA to feel very grounded and real. Mm -hmm. And obviously this is an organization that exists outside of space and time. (laughs) So we were inspired by films like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and Scott Pilgrim. And both those films really well use practical sets that kind of link to other fantastical practical sets. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that was something we all wanted to do as a team. So for example, the very first episode, but they're in the elevator, Mm -hmm. they come out of the elevator and they walk down that very long hallway into the time theater. And that's one set. And is that I, the bit when Loki notices the city for the first, well, whatever, you know. The... It's just after. Right. So it's like as they it, they had their little banter in the elevator and the doors open mm-hmm. and they go down that long hallway. And I think he's like, um, you were created by the timekeepers. Yes. And he's being yeah, like yeah, very yeah, highly yeah. strong about it. Mm-hmm. So it's when that they go down the stairs, I remember. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And we wanted to film. So with that, for example, I wanted to really feel like the audience were with the characters. So I think we filmed that, from what I recall, in two steady cam shots. So that basically just means that I did like a two shot, which is like kind of mm-hmm. mid about here. Um, and basically we did we had that run all the way into the time theatre and then I did a reverse behind their backs and that gave me cutting points, obviously, because mm-hmm. then you can pick out performance where you want to use performance. Yeah, so, you might want to use take one and the end of take three. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Is, is that something that you... Uh, we've, we're jumping ahead a little bit. I want, uh, but oh yeah, let's, sorry, let's, sorry. Let's, no, it's all right. But let's let's just go with this because I, <laughs> I actually wanted to ask you a lot about this. Like working mm-hmm. at the level of Marvel, how much freedom did you have to basically put your own stamp on this and say, "I'm going to do this in a single take"? Because um, actually, that was one of the things I complimented you on after I saw the first two episodes. Was I just texted you saying I loved the bit in I think it's in episode two when they go around into the lockers and it's just this like flowing single take shot that's like shot all under their eye lines it's just very tasteful and and not showy but it's like clearly 
got a little bit more voice than I think I'm used to seeing at like that type of level where you, it feels like things have to be covered in the edit just to make yeah. sure that it's going to make sense. But how much freedom did you have going into it to make those sorts of decisions? I actually had like, I'm always amazed like on everything I've done. I'm just like, you just gonna I let me do that? somehow <laughs> have maintained having my job because just to go back to sex education, mm. it started a bit there because I remember that was my first TV job and Ben Taylor, I remember he was like, just go for it. He was like, honestly, he's like, the main advice he gave me, which I think is very solid advice for any director. I'm listening. He was like, highlight any scene where you've done a wanna. <laughs> and he said, if you're obviously he said of the next scene, don't do it as a wanna. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. also you just you might want to pace up the edit. I mean, generally, my my rule of thumb is usually I I, I won't always plan to do something in a wanna. Sometimes it, sometimes it just comes down to schedule and time. Like if you're up against it on the day, particularly with a TV schedule where you have to move quite quickly, Sometimes you're like, actually, we're going to have to do this in a one -er, or but you always have two cameras running. So you have to use your B camera to kind of cover your butt, basically. Okay. So even the edit, the studio are like, oh, hey, we like it, but, you know. I'm Too slow. It's, yeah, I'm <laughs> bored. I want the pace to be faster, mm -hmm. or I don't like their read of this line. So that's kind of, whenever I do like a one -er, that's usually how I will maintain that, is you always have your safety option. And that's what also helps you from not getting fired. Gotcha. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. Oh, but, I just didn't get that. That yeah, is not a good enough <laughs> excuse. Yeah, but I think for me, like, so I, uh, sorry to interrupt, oh, yeah, no, but please, like please. in a single take shot like that, you mm -hmm. always also have a B camera running just in case. Yes. Okay. So basically, that's how we'll do it. So like, for example, that scene I mentioned with um, Tom and Owen in the hallway. That's why I did a reverse. So I, I think in my head, I was like, well, it'd be really cool if this could play out all as a long two shot, leading mm -hmm. them in. But you get the reverse just because, again, it helps you pace up. We did the same thing on Lamentus. With that was kind of I was really inspired. Like Bishop put um, before sunrise in in her script as a reference, oh, cool. and like and I love that movie so much. And I I just I think and Linklater does very classy single take. Movie. Yeah, like a school of rock, by the way, is amazing. Like yeah. Everyone loves that movie, obviously, and what I've... Sorry to just derail this, mm -mm. but what I've found as well is a lot of musicians cite School of Rock as, like, why they're musicians. Like, our generation of musicians really? did a show uh... recently where I talked to a bunch of bands and things like mm -hmm. that, and so many people brought up School of Rock. But if you watch that movie as a filmmaker, the amount of, like, times that Linklater is just holding on a scene... It, mm -hmm. uh, it's so impressive, especially on a pop movie like that. Mm -hmm. Well, he's also, I think, because he's like a genius at character, right? And putting people in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that's what long takes do. It's like, so Lamentus in episode three, it's about these two characters connecting and getting to know each other. And that's why, like, I wanted to do those kind of link later, like, you know, those kind of wandering. I don't want to say wander, but you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. kind of like you almost feel like you're going for a walk with the mm -hmm. characters. And so, but in terms of the practical approach, in terms of if anyone wants to be a director, the way I did that was I, I ran one basically that was like a looser wide two shot. And then I did one that was tighter. Mm -hmm. And then I did a reverse. So then I'm covered in the edit. If, but like, your, your instinct is to be like, I just want to hold on. Exactly. That. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So that's kind of the game you're always playing. Whereas there's uh, Sharu, for example, which is our big finale of episode three, that was intended as a wanna. I pitched it to the studio in that way and they were for it. And there were some scenes in the show, like uh, just to jump really far ahead now, like episode six, like, you know, the big finale moment. I knew I wanted that to feel like... It sounds really weird. I'm really inspired by music. So I suppose like quite musical and mm -hmm. like probably people have even seen it in sex education. Like I think in uh sorry I'm jumping on it. This is like welcome to my brain. No, but like, fine. Yeah, but like when Eric confronts um Adam basically at the school and we had the camera spin around them. I just love I love doing that. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. There's no other there's no deeper reason. It looks great. I just love spinning a <laughs> yeah. steady cam around people. Honestly, but, like yeah. I, I mean, ever since I mean, I'm a child of Christopher Nolan, like mm -hmm. the Dark Knight came at the right time when I was yeah. sixteen years old. He mm -hmm. spun the camera around the Joker yeah. when he was talking to Rachel. <laughs> and I was like, I'm gonna do that one day. <laughs> it just, <laughs> I want that shot. It just gives it such good energy. Yeah. And I think that's why it's disorientating, it's it's yeah. it does a lot. Like it mm -hmm. and it looks cool. <laughs> yeah, and that's why with like when when Tom's Loki runs into alternate TVA, it's meant, as you said, it's meant to feel disorientating and puts on the back foot. But also I knew it's the finale, right? And I was going to put big music under that moment from Natalie. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, and then um, basically Andrew, our camera op, he, he's amazing. And like, basically he was like, oh, I have a really cool idea for this. And he kind of pitched this idea with Autumn about how we could move around Loki. And I was like, oh, so cool. But also it was very helpful to me because we were very up against it with schedule. Got it. But in a weird way... 
it kind of gave the scene amazing energy because I remember my first AD, Richard, who's like a legendary first AD. And it's worth saying, so the first assistant director is not my assistant. <laughs> I think that's something that people it that needs to be. It. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they keep control of the schedule. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they keep you on track. <laughs> yeah. So basically the first AD, they're, they're, they're like complete. I mean, all the heads of department are so vital and important. But the first AD, it, it's such a close relationship with the director because essentially they're making sure that everyone is there on time. Everything is running on time. They'll talk to you about your setups and making the day. And usually they're actually hired by the studio. Yep. And basically, but me and Richard, so Richard, my AD, he'd worked on The Revenant, uh, Clueless, which was wow. so cool. Um, <laughs> Talk about different sides of the spectrum. <laughs> yeah, and he did Love, Simon. He's done like really beautiful kind of teen indie films and then these big, massive ones. Mm -hmm. But anyway, but he was wonderful but anyway but I remember he was like sweating and he was like we're not going to make it we're not going to make it and I remember Tom was like we will it's going to be great I'm going to do it and then I remember it was like this dance with like Tom and Andrew or camera up but I, I'm so proud of that shot because as you said like I love Christopher Nolan and mm -hmm. I was like we Nolan did, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> I love so, it yeah so I think yeah I think that answered your question. <laughs> well, well I, I, we were just having a conversation now. I'm yeah. not even sure where we started. It's what I said at the, you know, I think both of our brains are similar. Like, we'll just talk until we get somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, my next thought, though, is, mm -hmm. I mean, I've got two of them. Mm -hmm. One of them is Natalie Holt. And let's just mm -hmm. talk about that. But also when it comes to making shots like the one at the end of episode three, where it's a single take, or even mm -hmm. I think it's the start of episode five, where it's this like, sequence through mm -hmm. lots of different locations and is these like spinning camera movements or even mm -hmm. the start of episode six where you did this 2001-esque journey through <laughs> the universe yeah did working at this sort of level open up lots of like opportunity for you to think in a creative way that you hadn't had the opportunity to think in before Oh, completely. I mean, like, can we just do that? Yeah. Please? <laughs> no normally, basically, on my shorts and even on sex ed, like, you know, I'm thinking, how do we make this look like a really expensive production? And obviously, sex ed, like, had a great budget, but mm -hmm. it was still limited. It, limited in some ways. So, like, I think that was the thing me and Ben were always doing. We were like, OK, how do we make this feel cinematic? And mm -hmm. Ben's a genius at that. I mean, when you watch Catastrophe, that's also why I was so excited to work on it, because I felt like so in line with his taste. Yeah. With, like, he does like... um. I always call it like frame within a frame, mm -hmm. like how he frames. I just love it anyway. But um, Lots of foreground. Yeah. And I, I actually, I'll tell you now, I, <laughs> I see that you do that quite a lot as well yeah. with, with how you frame <laughs> things. And I've been inspired by that as well. And I just notice that as soon as you start like putting something in the foreground, it just adds something. It just yeah. does something. I just directed an advert and oh, I cool. literally went in the wide shot. I was like take it behind the wall and frame the wall in. And it was like, yep, that's a better shot. It was just that, yeah. that just made it better. Honestly, I had the same thing. So I remember with my shorts, like when I first started making them, it's just obviously like you're usually making it within limitations, right? Like you're making it maybe in like, I don't know, like your house yeah, or, or like outside on the street. Yeah. And you just kind of like, you always, the instinct is, like, okay, I'll just point the camera at the actor and maybe they'll have like a wall behind them. And I definitely did that quite a bit. And then I think obviously as I watched more stuff and thought more about just cinematography, yeah, it's like, it's such a, it's a very like basic thing, but it's a very simple thing that anyone can do. <laughs> and yeah, and just adding depth and foreground. There's a really amazing actually YouTuber called Every Frame a Painting. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, he doesn't do it anymore, which oh, is a shame. Oh, no. But yeah, he, <laughs> he was great when he, yeah. when he made things. It was like my film school, but I think he had one on Kurosawa about movement within the frame that mm -hmm. really inspired me because I, I hadn't even thought about using um, actors in the frame to bring movement in that way, which sounds, again, like a very basic thing, but it's just obviously as you're learning about filmmaking, it's just, yeah, you're, you're learning, right? Yeah. But, um, but to go back to the openings you spoke about, because I'd yeah. love to talk about those. Please do. So, yeah, so episode five, so basically... I would say like 99% of uh, the show we storyboarded with a range of storyboard artists, but Martin Mercer storyboarded pretty much all of it except for a few key sequences. I had different artists for Sheru and for the 106 opening. Mm -hmm. um, but everything else Martin Mercer did and he was excellent. But it was, I think for me that was amazing because... Basically, on the one hand, when COVID happened, I had to storyboard everything because Richard, my first AD, he had to know how many like background, who your actors in the background, how many background do we need to make this feel real? And mm -hmm. so I would try and board in as many people as I could to work that out. And we also worked with um, an amazing company called The Third Floor with Jesse, who led the team. And basically with Jesse, it's sort of like the best way I can describe it is they're almost like they take my boards and they would basically make them into almost interactive storyboards and or like 
a 3D walkthrough of certain shots. And that was the amazing thing working with Marvel is like my editor Callum on episode three, for example, like me and him would be like, oh, let's get this kind of shot. And we'd be like, oh, hey, can we get a bird's eye? Like if I didn't have a board for a shot I wanted to add, like the kind of transition shots. And I'd be like, okay, well, I want a meteorite to go from the left to the right of frame, for example, to draw our eye. Um, and these, this is the rough placement. And then Jesse would go off with his team and they'd send us the shot within, I don't know, 48 hours, which was, you know, crazy. But, yeah. but that's the thing. At that level, you can do that. So that's kind of how we planned everything. But with the opening of Ep5, so me and, Aut- and Autumn, my DP, obviously, was storyboarding stuff with me. And so me and her, like... We love the idea of like turning reality on its head, right, for episode five. So hence, even me doing that, it's yeah, like what yeah. the camera does. And so we had that transition planned and going into the elevator um, and then in, and into the timekeeper's chamber. And in the script originally, I remember Eric had, because Eric was our, he was one of our writers, but he was with us across all production as well. So when we were doing rewrites and tweaking stuff, like he was the one leading the charge on that. And Basically, Eric was, had pitched this really cool idea where he was like, it's the TV, I think he put something like the TVA, status quo, like everything seems normal. Um, and then we go into the timekeeper's chamber and we see the head of this timekeeper. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. And originally, the idea was we would go from the timekeeper's chamber straight to the courtroom with Renslayer and Sylvie. But it's just in the edit, when I was putting this together, it just wasn't quite landing right, like going from the eye of the timekeeper to um, Renslayer hitting the ground. Mm-hmm. And we'd, we'd boarded it that way, but it just wasn't feeling quite right. And story-wise, because we restructured a lot of five in the edit in places. And I remember just thinking, it just feels like you kind of want to know where Loki is and like give a tease of that. So that's that's how basically... so. We had that shot, obviously, where you go into the void and you pass through the city and you see him at the bus stop and then you see Elioth. But when I originally covered that scene, this was partly because of also schedule. We were so tight on the day. And so Autumn was like, OK, we don't have enough time to do multiple setups, but we could do this on the crane as like this one and I'll go really high and we can push in on him and we'll get the lines and then we'll, yeah, and then that'll be it. And 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 basically, originally the shot didn't travel up above the bus stop. So it's kind of, I'm giving all this information just to explain that it's such a puzzle when you're directing something. So basically I knew, so I had this beginning with the timekeeper's chamber and going through the TVA. And then I was like, oh wait, actually, if I use the eye of the timekeeper as a transition to the mist, of the void, that could be a really cool way to do a transition wipe. And then I can make this into just one big one-er. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So that happened in the edit. So hang on. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. (laughs) The plan wasn't for that to be this one gliding through all the different locations. That was never Mm -hmm. the plan. That's something you found in the edit. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Because that that was one of my favourite parts like of of the show I was like this just feels so distinct because clearly Mm. the one at the end of episode three was so planned like that that sort of like almost video game-esque sort of traveling through with (laughs) with uh the two Mm -hmm, Lokis mm -hmm. um and then this one felt like a sort of similar style but like very much like here's where we are like here's all the pieces yeah and that wasn't the plan yeah so originally (laughs) amazing yeah it went up to the timekeeper's head And then it went boom into the courtroom. Right. And then the thing we added, because the camera didn't used to go up and show a life, we added that in post. Mm -hmm. So the move usually ended with all our Lokis exiting frame and then our visual effects team and what I did with Jesse in previs, I was like, oh, can you just see this will work? Could you add a camera move where we just crane up and reveal the monster? Isn't it amazing that you can do that? Like, yeah. what, what, an, what an opportunity that to go yeah. from like making shorts and like limited budgets and then all of a sudden going, can you just add a camera movement in post, please? Yeah, easy. It is bananas. It's bananas. <laughs> and the work of so many talented people. But yeah, but that, that basically, so the opening of five, that's how that happened. But I just wanted to talk about it because I think there's that thing where people assume that it's like all really early stages you find that, but you don't. You're finding like the best way to tell the story right until you give the story over. I mm-hmm. mean, the opening of Six actually is probably a good one to talk about in that regard because so basically Eric had pitched this really cool homage. Homage? Hom- homage? I'm saying, Either I'm one. saying that really weirdly. <laughs> homage. Um, basically to contact, which I love. But he, I think in the script it said basically we move through space and we travel to the end of time and we see the timeline and the citadel i mean <laughs> i mean just like you as a director go like brilliant like yeah <laughs> we see the end of time great i'm going to try and visualize that now thank you <laughs> yeah i remember reading it and being like this is awesome and then i was like oh no <laughs> i have to work this out now but 
I luckily, so this one wasn't with Martin, the storyboard artist that did most of it. I did this with a storyboard artist called Darren. Mm -hmm. And basically with Darren, like me and him, I mean, he's a genius and he's done loads of stuff for Marvel, but we we like nerded out about space and we were talking about, I think he was like, I mean, what was important to me and him was, well, the show's about time. So let's have this kind of, even though we're kind of, I think what Eric did have in the script though is the idea of the contact thing, you know, it's almost like you're zooming out and zooming out. So that was in there. But I think something Darren and me were talking about was, okay, well, let's play with the idea of time within that um, visually. And also something he pitched, which I thought was genius, was as you reach the end for the timeline, because obviously as everyone sees in our timeline, because basically the writers had this really helpful drawing of the timeline with branches that they drew for me when I first came on. And I was like, oh, I understand now. So that's what I used for the chronomonitor. But basically the timeline was like just a straight line. And I think that what he pitched, which I thought was genius, he was like, what if it isn't a straight line? I think he pitched it like what the Citadel was like the needle on a record player and the edge of the record is the timeline and mm-hmm. it's circular going around it. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. So and then that's where the idea of it being wrapped around. Exactly. Right, okay. Yeah, and just the idea that I, I love that the TVA basically all their technology shows it's a straight line, but actually when we see it, it's this circle. And we even, we even put that in our Miss Minutes dialogue with, oh, we think of time as one straight line, but what is it actually? And But that, I, that makes sense as well, because yeah. when you introduce he who remains, <laughs> he's obviously in the centre of all of it, but mm-hmm. he's basically talking about how, like, no matter what you do, we're all going to end up back here. This is both a beginning and an end, mm-hmm. and we're going round and round yeah. and round, and that... Is my shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, I absolutely fucking love. I love time loops so much, yeah. and it feels like what you've done. And this is something I wanted to get on to as well. Yeah. Is in the episode one or two when yeah, I think it's episode two mm-hmm. when uh, Loki and Mobius are sitting down and talking about mm-hmm. like you could obviously read it as an allegory for religion. Somebody being like, yeah. "You believe in all this stuff," and him being like, "Well, what you believe in is is nuts as well, whatever." Yeah. But for me, it felt like this meta commentary on Marvel Mm -hmm. being like we're coming out of the 10 years or so of Marvel that we've done we're seeing that as what was supposed to happen and now we're coming out of it and the timekeepers they're figuring out the end of time are the Marvel writers who are still figuring out where we're going next (laughs) like that kind of is what it felt like to me and were you aware of that is that something you were like consciously (laughs) doing because like that meta text stuff like was so like exciting to me i was just like this is exactly where marvel should go next and that's what it felt like to me yeah no i think there's always i suppose when you're approaching the story right you're always just thinking of the best way to tell the story but then the like as you mentioned the kind of nature of who you're making it for obviously folds into it and also just the themes right the idea of i mean even like with loki's identity like are we just repeat um repeated are we doomed to just repeat the same mistakes over and over again can you change can you break the cycle and yeah so I think the circular timeline I just yeah it kind of all came together for me when Darren pitched that and I just was like oh. obviously yeah no, it's just like yeah, yeah. obviously yeah. <laughs> and I think that's also something I want to talk about because sometimes I think like not all directors but I just think it's such a massive team effort and I think that's a big part of your job as a director is like I said like you're working with really really amazing people and I think that's the thing it's knowing when to take the pitch or not take the pitch and it really so much is about that's why I always think like a good idea can come from like anyone and I always try and describe directing as like you are like a sieve and you catch everything and you let through the ones that you go yep that's going to make it into the final mix if I'm going to keep this (laughs) metaphor going Um, but yeah that's what we're, we're I'm baking a thing and you can pitch me whatever you want and I decide what makes it into the into the yeah. final thing. You're kind of a bit like, I guess, like he who remains in some ways because like it has to be, I think that what I love about his character, and so I will come back to the opening of Six because there was some extra stuff with that, but it's like he's so introverted and extroverted, right? And I think you kind of need to be both sides of the coin to be a director. And obviously all of us are a mixture of both of those things, but it's because in some ways it can be quite a lonely job because... It's, it's how best to explain it. So when you're doing other jobs on set, if you're an actor, for example, you have fellow actors, usually. Most projects do, mm-hmm. unless it's like just one actor. But usually you have other actors and they're like your buddies and your pals and you can chat to them. But like as a director, it's kind of just you. And I think it was really funny, like one of my editors was on set and I needed, like, he was with second unit and I needed to get a shot. And I just said to him, oh, can you just get the shot? Because well, I'll, I'll be over here. We didn't, and I, don't, I can't remember where Mo was at that moment. I think Mo was with me, actually. She's my second unit director. She's also a stunt coordinator. Mm-hmm. That's why it was. She was doing that. And it was like a, a push in on something. And so basically he was like, OK, yeah, yeah. And he was so excited. Obviously, he's like, oh, I get to direct for a moment. <laughs> but I remember he told me after it was Paul, my editor at one. And he was like, man, he's like, directing's like really lonely. And I never realized that. And I was like, yeah, it is in some ways. 
ways. But I think that's the weird thing is that you have to be really good at spending time by yourself because so much of it you are by yourself. But at the same time, you have to be like highly social and able, well, ideally able to communicate with people. Quickly um, as well. Like yes. You have to be able to have lots of lots of very, very yeah. quick <laughs> interactions and then move on to the next thing. Exactly. And I'll, I'll be yeah. honest, like, I think I think I thrive in that environment. I'm sure you do as well. But mm -hmm. I feel like that environment makes sense to me. I'm like, I know what we're all doing. I know what my role yeah. is in, in this. But when yeah. I'm maybe outside of that sort of uh, situation, I find myself a little bit like, I don't know what my what my what am I doing? Like, when I'm, but when I'm on set, it feels like I get it. I know exactly what I'm doing. I know my I know what I'm, I know who I'm talking to and why. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I'm like Casey in the real world. It's right. like it's like someone asked me who my variant was, and I was like, it's definitely Casey. <laughs> like, but like, bless Casey. But yeah, but I just I think that's the interesting thing with the job, right? But anyway, but episode six. Yep. So yeah, so Darren pitches the amazing timeline idea, and I'm like, that's so cool. And so visually, that's when we land and so we start building this opening and like Kevin Feige in the studio are like oh this is really cool um, what's your plan with like sound design and I think at one point I was like it should be silent because mm -hmm. it's space mm -hmm. and everyone was like it's cool but, cool, but, but keep keep yeah. you know keep exploring stuff yeah. and <laughs> so I was like okay so I remember then like me and Emma McCleave my editor Sarah Bennett her assistant and Kevin Wright who was basically our producer across everything from Marvel and I worked very closely with him across story and basically all all four of us were like okay so I think we were thinking oh maybe let's add some music and basically one idea I had when we were trying to brainstorm how to like think about the sound on this sequence was that so at the very end when we pull out the timeline I was like oh well we're actually in the timeline now it's when it goes very 2001 Space yeah. Odyssey mm -hmm. and I was just like okay well why don't we hear like the sounds of life? <laughs> Which I thought everyone would be like, on your bike, we're not yeah. doing that. Um, yeah. <laughs> nice arty idea. Yeah. Move on. But they were into it. And, yeah. and I was like, like a baby crying or like the city. And then I was like, or oh, maybe like, I don't know, a quote. And so we kind of took the beginnings of that idea to there. So we had a few quotes from, I think, just the earth. I can't remember who they were by, but mm -hmm. we put some quotes in. And we also put in some like cityscape and just soundscape ideas, just the idea of kind of feeling like you were passing through the earth anyway. So we show that to the studio and Kevin Feige and Stephen and Lou and Victoria are all like, this is super cool. Mm -hmm. But And Kevin Feige was like, it kind of sparked an idea in his head where he was like, oh, I like the quotes you have in there. But he's like, you know what we haven't done? We've never put quotes on the Marvel logo because we were always trying to, across the show, think, um, where could we subvert, you know, the Marvel fanfare? Where do we use the Marvel fanfare? And I can talk more on that in a second. So it's just so much stuff. <laughs> there is. Um, but yeah, but basically, so we were like, that's amazing. And so we then basically... I it's say, one of those ideas that when you hear it, you go, yeah. oh. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and you, like, as soon as you hear it, you're like hair raising because like, yeah. that's what it felt like when I was watching it. So I can imagine when you heard it, you were like, I can, I know exactly what you want now. Yeah. And so basically, like, so Emma and, and Sarah, they, they basically started pulling all these quotes. And I think the idea we went with, well, let's use sound effects or quotes on each character and let's build it into this Greek chorus that kind of feels really loud and really big up to the Marvel logo. And then we'll reset it as we go into space. Mm -hmm. And then we were so excited by that that we were like, oh man, in space. Let's bring in sounds like the idea of the sounds of the earth, but let's do it with quotes from people across our history that aren't MCU. And we also worked with the um, Disney diversity team as well in terms of like who we wanted to hear in that moment. So I must stress it was a massive team effort, but really credit to Emma and Sarah because like they built that. That's the thing because you know like I'm giving notes and ideas, and yep. so is Kevin Wright, my producer. And but we're they're all pitching like in. clicking and dragging yeah. and doing they're building all. It. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think the the thing with the Marvel thing that was exciting is that you know we really wanted that song that everyone associates with Cap at the beginning because I think honestly it's just it was a bit quiet at the start and I was like oh let's have some music and then I was like oh we should use that song because and I think the thing I loved about it as a Marvel fan is it felt like a really beautiful goodbye to what had come before yep. and then it's kind of taking us into what's to come mm -hmm. so yeah and then with the movement across space I think honestly for us it was just about picking out different quotes from different people that we thought were cool and just as a team like working together to obviously try and make it representative and then music in places we got Kylie Minogue in there which is like <laughs> a big success for me that is amazing does she know? 
I, I assume so because she'd have to give us permission. But sure. I've been trying to like put a song of hers. I tried to get locomotion into um, sex education, and my editor Callum was like, "We're not putting Kylie Minogue," and I was like, "But I love Kylie," and like, <laughs> but we just couldn't get her song to work. And then an episode... that is incredible. Is yeah. that the one that you're happiest with? Like the one that you've snuck <laughs> in there? What other sounds did you sneak in there that you like? Oh, there's so many. Like, I'm just trying to think now. There's a there's a quote that actually came from Skywalker's sound. Um, and I don't want to get the name of him wrong because I didn't, I wasn't aware of him until we were doing this sequence, but I bought his book. He, he's a philosopher, I think, Alan Watts. Mm-hmm. We put a quote about time at the top because I knew that, because obviously the beginning part is very Marvel centric and it builds up into this Greek chorus. And then you almost have to like reset it, right? When we go into the bit across space because it's almost like a palate cleanser because then mm-hmm. it's like, okay, now we're going to hear sounds from Earth. And it was like, how do we use I, how do we get to that transition and make that clear? And I think actually it was something from the Disney the Disney diversity team. I think they said, oh, it'd be probably good to have some quotes about time in there just so it's clear what you're doing. And mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, that's sensible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And so Skywalker, Matt there was like, oh, well, Alan, I think his name's Alan Watts. I don't want to get it wrong. But like, but he basically... He was like, he's amazing. You should listen to this, you know, listen. And he sent me like a YouTube clip of this whole like lecture he did. But we were like, wow. So we we put one of his quotes in. And I think that was the key thing is just kind of showing that, oh, it's actually about time. And then we go into the sounds of Earth. But yeah. But uh, anyway, I could rabbit on about it for forever. But I just, I really want to Clearly you've just been like soaking (laughs) in it for so long. (laughs) And it's amazing, I think, and for me and for everybody who's watching and listening to Mm -hmm. this to hear that like, how much of this is just like it starts here and then it sort of just builds and 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 like all these different opinions and people bring something to it and you figure out there's the ending like product but so many people go into it but you are just the person who's like I don't know herding it like figuring out where we're going and that's that I mean it's, it's amazing to hear about it on that level as well that still at that level it's basically just people going like would would this would, would this work would this yeah. work would this work and i think that's amazing <laughs> it makes me almost think of improv it's like yes and you know and i think that's the amazing thing about marvel as a studio and they probably spoiled me as a studio because i haven't worked with other than netflix yeah. but i haven't worked with like a you know like a big film studio before so i just was like i hope other studios work like this but they're just really collaborative and i think the thought is with them is always best idea wins mm-hmm. and that for me totally fits in my philosophy as a filmmaker and that I think as I said like I think a good idea can come from anyone like I think that and I think I hope that the team felt encouraged to pitch in stuff because you know you're working with really smart people that usually just all love the comics as well and so many easter eggs came from so many different people Mm -hmm. and I think that was really for me I was I don't know I think that's maybe why I wanted to direct is and why I like putting on plays as a kid because it's like a community thing you know what I mean Mm -hmm. like it's about building your team and you get to like as you said like it's you're like the sieve yes <laughs> i like that <laughs> like, mm-hmm. that everything goes through but you're only as good as the people you're working with mm-hmm. i honestly i think with all our actors i was so lucky to work with so many talented people so it was about hearing their ideas out giving them space to play on the day obviously getting what's written but then being like oh you know like owen he's a he's an amazing improviser and yeah. he would just throw in lines and be really was playful. Was the, uh, the first episode when he says, I'm always looking up at you. It's, I like it. It feels appropriate. Like, is that him it, just improvising? It's, impro- it's improvising. I yeah. love that bit. And speaking <laughs> yeah. of Owen Wilson as well, but my thinking for, for him is that he's got such a calm, I know everything's going to be all right sort of vibe to him that really works with somebody who should know how all of time goes. Yeah. Like somebody who's just like, this is fine. Like, yeah. I know it's all going to work <laughs> out. Like, because I've seen it. I've done it all before. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of what I got from <laughs> Owen Wilson's casting in that part. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. And I think because also he wanted to do something. I remember when I spoke to him on the phone, he was like, I want to do something really outside of myself. And I was like, oh, this is cool. Mm. And like, and he pitched the idea of, you know, like the silver hair and obviously the moustache is a reference to the character mm-hmm. that he was based on and the, the real person that he's based on. Mm-hmm. But I, I think that for me was so interesting that he kind of changed how much, I guess, because we, we know him so much from his like sandy kind yeah. of like long hair. And yeah, and I think for me... It's sort of like, um, I don't know, like, almost like a boho sort of like, yeah. um, like sort of hippie-ish <laughs> sort of vibe. And in this, he's definitely Different. not that. Yeah. yeah, and I think that was exciting. And also just... 
he would just throw in these lines. But I remember even he he'd said to me, he was like, I can't believe how much of the improvisation's in there. And I was like, it's great. <laughs> of course it's in there. Because like, I spoke of it before on other things, but the bit where he's like, don't you have candy on Asgard? And then Tom was like, grapes, nuts. And yeah. I, I, that's them improvising. Right, right, I just right. kept that in. And but then yeah. what does he say? No, no wonder you're always in a bad mood or something. Oh, he says, no wonder you're so bitter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> great, yeah. yeah. And then um, to move on, finally, to, yeah. Nat- to Natalie Holt the uh, composer for mm-hmm. this, who I will just say, because I'm allowed and I'm not associated with Marvel whatsoever, <laughs> I think aside from Alan Silvestri's Avengers theme, this is the best music that Marvel mm-hmm. has ever had in the, the end. Like the themes, the the sort of the interesting, like bold direction that it goes yeah. in, the weird textures that she puts in, like the absolutely astounding. At what point did you go, I'm just going to let Natalie... Because <laughs> almost part of it, <laughs> And this is what I meant earlier when I said that some of it felt more distinctive than Marvel can usually go into, Mm -hmm. is that by letting Natalie's music sort of lead a lot of the scenes and blend between yeah. those like different moments, it almost felt kind of operatic. Yeah. And that was, I mean, I assume incredibly <laughs> intentional, but it was so dreamy and just distinctive. And I just thought it was incredible. And now I want you to talk about that now that you've heard <laughs> how I feel about it. <laughs> well, she's, I think, as everyone knows, a genius. Yeah. Um, just, I want to just point out as well that she's the person who threw eggs at Simon Cowell on the X Factor, <laughs> which is just, you know, amazing. <laughs> Very Loki of her. I, I know. Think. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that she's seems clearly <laughs> mischievous and, and, and right for this. <laughs> yeah, so basically we had composers pitching for it and Natalie was one of the composers. And basically I remember that, so we all gave them, it was basically during lockdown, so essentially just explain. So I'd filmed half the show mm-hmm. and then we got shut down like the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. And during the shutdown, I think we were shut down for four months and it was like I was isolating in Atlanta and wow. so were the cast and we were all, I, I think I was living on my own and honestly it was just a way for me to like, stay sane I was like okay well I have all this footage I'm just gonna edit the footage we've done with my editors and let's just see what we're working with let's see what we've made oh cool Uh, yeah so a lot of episode one I edited during that and but basically with the music I had temp music basically across scenes in episode three and episode four I think a place though because I was working with all my editors at the same time but I would really say that I think I honed in on what the music could be with Callum and Emma, at least in terms of tonally where my head was at, in terms of temp. And I think when I pitched on the show, I always knew that I wanted to use theremin in some way because I had Clara Rockmore, um, the swan, in a playlist that I gave to the studio. And that actually plays on Rens- in Renslayer's office. But mm-hmm. I think something I was really finding was this wasn't like a needle drop kind of show. Like there might be key places for them, like Renfair, for example. Mm-hmm. But generally it felt like we needed this to be score because it just felt I mean we always talk about it but it felt like this really big scale movie so I was like we need music to match that so we had a lot of composers pitching and I gave them the time theatre scene the very early one to like temp to basically just to see what their take was Mm -hmm. Um, and so Natalie pitched and she did this amazing music and I remember what was so exciting to me about it is that she was really inspired by Loki's character and his identity and that to me was so exciting because you know as the words you used, she said it has to be big operatic because it's Loki and it has to fit fit his personality Mm -hmm. and that to me was like music to my ears because I was like this is a show about his identity and what makes a Loki a Loki was like our team's central question so I was like that's already amazing and I just just want to point out I love (laughs) the fact that the show itself is a Loki that it's such a like you don't know where it's going next kind of show you don't know what it's doing (laughs) And you handled that beautifully, like the sort of shifting in story. And we're doing this now and now we're doing this. But that to me felt like, well, of course, that's what the show is doing, because it's about Loki and you never know what he's going to do next. So, yeah, Yeah, I just wanted to point that out as well. That's so lovely. I love that. (laughs) But yeah, so basically she sent us that and she also had like just some kind of weird experimental like kind of electronic stuff she just made for fun basically that was also sent to us and I was like who is this person Mm. because you had this like really bold operatic music and then you also had this kind of weird almost Blade Runner sounding kind of electronic stuff so I was like I feel like she taste wise is in the same space as us and I was like yeah I really I think and everyone was so excited by her And we were like, let's go for it. And basically, so when she started, Marvel were like, she should make a suite for the show. So it was about creating the themes for the show. 
And this was amazing because I basically, when we were in lockdown, I'd spoke to Marvel and said, actually, if we can, I know normally I think the composer comes on a bit later, but I think it'd be really helpful if we could get them now. And they were like, totally, because it's just the show for me, like music as a filmmaker, I love music. And I and I think it was so much part of the identity. And if I have music I can hear, sometimes I'll just think of shots or ways I want to cover a scene. Mm-hmm. And like, and it helps you just get an idea of the personality. Yeah, and the personality of the show. Mm-hmm. And, and it also gets everyone excited on set. Like when we went back to filming, Tom would play Natalie's music to like set the tone for everyone. And great. I thought that was amazing. You so, hear so many great stories about when the music mm-hmm. is done simultaneously with the film and how yeah. they kind of inspire <laughs> each other. And like that, I think that should be done more often. And just, I just, know that like mm-hmm. money <laughs> and like how things progress yeah. that's not always possible but amazing that yeah. you got to do it on this I think I was inspired to do it because on sex education obviously I went later than Ben so they already had their composer so I, I was using the music that they were already using in the first half of the show and again that really helped me rhythmically work out in the edit like oh let's cut the scene this way or have this kind of feeling to it so yeah so anyway so with Natalie she made this amazing suite but the first piece of music she made us was that Loki title music. I remember just being like, hot damn. That's it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. I was like, this is incredible. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, all her themes and like, oh, and I should say, so when she pitched, she'd put a theremin in her pitch and we hadn't spoken. I didn't right. tell them anything so about that. So that was just like an yeah. in sync type of situation. Yeah. and it kind of goes back to the taste thing. I was just like, this person is on the same page as me, but also going, obviously, because she's incredible, going so beyond what I had thought of and I and I remember she was referencing like a clockwork orange and I obviously love Kubrick I think mm-hmm. it's very clear in the show obviously um, <laughs> and I just was like I really want to work with this person and she was nice and I feel I think it's Amy Poehler or Tina Fey that said this but like you want to hire people that at 2am you want to talk to still yeah <laughs> and like maybe that's just a rule for life I think but, so yeah <laughs> yeah but yeah but basically I really liked her and yeah and it was just amazing working with her and basically her music definitely going back in after the pandemic because well not that like, it was over just that we were basically back to we were safe enough to film um when we went back after the lockdown essentially her music definitely inspired how I shot lots of stuff, how I thought about the show. And then it was just really working out, okay, so where do we have needle drops? You know, like uh, the opening of episode three, like Demons is a song I love. Mm-hmm. I've, we we spent a while trying to find the right song for that. But, you know, I love that music. And also, Isn't it amazing as well that like yeah. with, with Marvel that you get to go like, which song that yeah. I love can I <laughs> afford to yeah. just like put in this now? Like, Because that it's is wild. something that I just... <laughs> had to avoid my entire life. He's like, I can't afford songs. <laughs> it's so crazy because I love Haley, the musician, and I and she messaged me and I was like, oh, I can now spoke to this musician that I love. That is amazing. Yeah. I but, also yeah. love, I sent you a, a, somebody's TikTok, <laughs> didn't I, of someone being like, they've used the music from Sims. And you were just like, that's just from a, a licensed site. Like, that's just generic sort of like, like fairground music that yeah. happens to be in the Sims. And I love the Sims. So I was actually very happy yeah. that happened. I was like, oh, excellent. We have a Sims reference in there. Yeah, it was a Sims reference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but yeah, but with Natalie, I think, and there was just also like, even for example, that episode five opening I spoke about in a lot of detail, I put that visually together, but I remember saying to her, oh, could you... Um, like this is it but like see I said I think the main note I gave her was about scale just to honestly help me sell this shot to the studio Mm -hmm. that I'd made because it is expensive (laughs) you know the crazy city thing and (laughs) going up to the monster (laughs) and she sent us that music and oh I mean it made me like teary like I was like this is so cool and Mm -hmm. it reminds me a bit of like John Carpenter Mm -hmm. and like yeah but I just I think that's the really key thing with like the composer right is that they are so much I mean for me like as a writer, I'll just listen to movie soundtracks while I write. And I think there are so, I mean, so many that are so iconic. And mm-hmm. yeah. They're just ones that like fit the vibe for it. Um, yeah. And, and be, you, you and Natalie were just in sync. You'd never worked together before? No. Oh, wow. I'd never worked. Honestly, the only person that I brought on that I'd worked with before was Callum Ross, who was mm-hmm. on Sex Education with me. And he's just a genius with character and comedy and drama. And he hadn't done anything with effects. And then hilariously ended up, um, when we were working out who should do the episodes, he ended up doing episode three and episode four. Five, which were the most effects heavy episodes so me and him were both learning how to do all this at the same time but obviously we you know we work really well as a team together so but he was the only person I think other than that it was all new heads of department because you know we were hiring as well from America so basically but Natalie 
pitched on it. But that's probably worth talking about as well. Like a lot of our team were British, not intentionally. I think a lot of our crew were from America, but like most of our cast were American. I remember Owen was saying it's only me and Miss Minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously he who remains at the end. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but anyway, a wild ride. <laughs> uh, absolutely. And this is, this is I'll, I'll bring it to a close now because what mm-hmm. a huge conversation we've had and I can keep going, <laughs> but I, my camera is going to die. Um, <laughs> so... You've announced that you're not going to do season two. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're definitely going to stick to that. You're not going to change your mind. It's, it's like when Daniel mm-hmm. Craig was like, I'm never, never doing another Bond. <laughs> and then he was like, I just needed a break. I'm going to do it again. You definitely yeah. don't just need a break and you, you, you won't, you're definitely not going to come back for season two. Yeah. And it's no, I must stress, it's like no bad blood or anything like that. No, I, I don't I imagine love, it is. Yeah. I love Marvel so much. And like, I think people can hopefully see that in the amount of references, visual ones I've put across the show. Yeah. I don't think um, anyone could think that there's no, like, yeah. I assume it's because you want to go and do something of your own yeah I think for me it's just so when I started the show it was always intended well not always obviously but like when I started it was six episodes because obviously I, and I should say some people are like oh did she know about season two like no, I knew about it obviously for like a year sure but it's just that when I started I've been on it for I think two and a half years now the show so I've been on it for a long time mm-hmm. and when I started they were like it's going to be six episodes and it's this story and I was like cool and that's always how I thought about it and I just put everything I had into it. Like I said, I haven't stopped for a long time. <laughs> like Even over when we were locked down, I was still working every day on it because I just was like, well, I just want to give this all and make it as good as it can be. Mm. Um, but I just think in my head, I was always thinking about it in that way. And, you know, I'm also a writer and I had these other projects and I have a few other things that are yet to be announced. And I just Great. kind of felt like I want to focus on those next. And I, I think as well, like for me, I'm just so excited to see where the story goes. And I think it's, so ex- I'm so flattered and happy that Disney and Marvel were like, this is so awesome. We want to keep telling this story. But I just felt like this part was my part. And I think uh, I'm always anxious. I, I reference this in an article, so maybe it's good I talk about it here so people don't think I'm an egotistical monster. But I should, just to explain. So I, I think I know what you're going to say about aliens, right? Yes. <laughs> I don't think that is egotistical. That's totally fair. Like, that is what happened. Like, yeah. somebody set up the groundwork, somebody else took yeah. over, and it was a different thing. That's all you're saying. You're yeah. not being like, I'm Ridley Scott. No, that's why, because I said it in an article, and I was like, oh, God. People I are really be like, don't think that. She's Ridley Scott. And no, I'm like, I ridiculous. really do not. Yeah. I really do not. But it's just that... Because I love that franchise, but I I really think that, you know, that first film is Ridley's. James Cameron did the second film. I think in the article, I was like really tired and I was like, and then they brought in the guy and he was like, James Cameron. And I'm like, yes. And like, I was horrified because like Titanic is a film I'm all obsessed i'm obsessed with titanic of course basically. yeah you're a child um, of the 90s i love it i understand i can quote like every oh actually this is a fun bit of trivia for you Hit so me. over lockdown on whatsapp i watch in our in our different homes obviously in atlanta mm-hmm. i watch titanic with sophia and tom and we all love it mm-hmm. like we're all like titanic nerds and i remember thinking this is great <laughs> like, i also just love the fact that like now like that feels like what they are like the sort of like this doomed yeah. tragedy like yeah. of, of a romance and, yeah it's kind of got a titanic yeah. vibe to it but but with time instead yeah. of a boat <laughs> but yeah but on the oh but sorry on the alien thing so this is the problem with my brain this is probably why everyone's like the show's so weird because my brain is like all over the place and i can't like focus on and i've thing. like i've said it's like a low-key because you never know what it's going to do next and you're like no no, no i'm just i'm just like that just uh, really scatty men- yeah but like but basically, I love Alien because it really set a tone and it was one type of movie. Mm-hmm. And then Aliens, you know, James Cameron comes along and he doesn't blow it up, but he builds upon the world with what the aliens mean and what they are. And that's so cool. But then also changes the tone and the genre and pushes the story forward in a really cool way. And I think for me, that's how I feel about this is that I, I honestly gave it my all. And I feel like, I mean, like I love film noir and like detective stories and it, it got that itch for me and like I just I'm so proud of everything we did on it but I just feel like it needs the you know the next person to push it and make it weirder and I think that's the opposite of egotistical I think that you're just allowing you're like that's (laughs) done my part and now I'm I'm excited to see what happens next and just letting it go Um, that's that's amazing I think that's just how I felt about it but I must stress it's like one of the best experiences of my life it's changed my life Um, yeah and I'm just so proud of the show and I've just loved be. seeing the cosplay the art the fan responses and seeing what you know some people liked and what some people didn't like and like seeing those debates like I I, I think creating anything that creates conversation is exciting to me so yeah well congratulations <laughs> I think you should be very proud I'm so excited to see thank what you. you do next Kate Heron thank you so much thank for you. coming to talk to me <laughs> thank you thank Goodbye. you bye
I probably looked in the camera like a million times by accident. That's all right. Just looking into it. Yeah, staring it down. <laughs> I can't believe we, I didn't even mention the... Oh, just casually <laughs> wearing it. I think that's okay, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's best not to bring it up. <laughs> thank you very much. No, thank, that was one of my favourite ones. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I certainly did. I could have spoken for hours with Kate. I'm not sure how long we did speak for, but it was certainly a while. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I want to thank our sponsor, Surfshark VPN. They're offering you 83% off with three extra months for free when you use the promo code Jack Howard. Surfshark help you protect your data, but also they allow you to change your location on things like Netflix so you can enjoy content that's not available in your country. Don't forget you can use my promo code Jack Howard. It will give you 83% off with three extra months for free. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you soon. Bye. <laughs>